Hello! How is everyone doing? I haven't done a vlog in a while and I'm just kind of bored tonight, so I thought I would do a vlog! Well, as you can see, I'm back home. I am on winter break right now. And I went to Arizona for the first part of it to visit family down there. Usually visiting family comes with uh, emotional turmoil, but it didn't this time as much as usual, which is definitely a plus. The other thing that happened on the way back, like the last day that I was in the car on the way back to Michigan from Arizona, I noticed that Thunderfoot posted a video. Now you guys may not exactly know about all the stuff that happened over the summer, for your sake I kind of hope you don't, but I was kind of personally involved in that whole email scandal thing that went down, so I've been kind of very, very angry with Thunderfoot for a, quite a while now, and I've become very disappointed in the kind of stuff that I've seen from him lately. I used to really like his science videos and some of his other videos that he did against creationists and stuff like that. I always was kind of willing to give him the benefit of the doubt on some things, even when I thought he was wrong. I was always willing to say, okay, maybe he's just more science smart than he is social smart. But ugh, my opinions have changed very, very quickly since I have seen him really screw a lot of things over for people that I care about, and that really crosses a line for me. But what really bothers me is not so much Thunderfoot's criticism of things like feminism and stuff like that. It's his dishonesty. Like, I have never seen somebody with so much hubris as Thunderfoot that he would be so deliberately dishonest about people that he disagrees with. I am not a huge fan of P.Z. Myers or any of those people. I disagree with them on issues. But the things that he was accusing them of, and the way he spun the thing with Free Thought Blogs, was not at all an honest representation of what was going on. And initially, again, I was willing to give him some benefit of the doubt, and then as soon as I became involved in it, I realized how messy the situation actually was, and how dishonest he was being about it. And in his latest video, he's continuing to be dishonest. Let me put it this way. Somebody choosing to moderate their own channel or Twitter, someone choosing not to communicate on a certain social network with someone or a group of someone's, is not the same thing as silencing that someone or group of someone's. That person that is blocked or banned from a channel or a Twitter can still post on their own Twitter or their own channel. There is absolutely no reason why someone should listen to you on their own... in their own domain. You're not entitled to that. If you want to disagree with somebody, you don't have to go to their channel and post on it. You can post on your own channel. You still have freedom to speak. But somebody with their own private property or in their own private domain is perfectly entitled to moderate what goes on in that domain because it belongs to them, not to you. Someone's Twitter or someone's Facebook or someone's YouTube channel is their property, not yours. The fact that you want YouTube or Twitter to be an open forum is irrelevant. If you believe that everyone's Twitter or everyone's YouTube or something should be an open forum of discussion, that's the way you think things should be. But for a lot of people, it's not that way. It's also really silly how you talk about, oh, I went to this experiment and everyone was rational and then I came back to the secular community and everyone was crazy. You're comparing somebody going to work and doing their job, where they're expected to be professional, to someone acting a certain way in their personal life, that is, on their Twitter. They're completely different spheres of influence. Melody or anyone else is going to act differently in the office than they are on their Twitter. And 
for the same reasons I mentioned before, they are entitled to act that way on their Twitter. It's really not your business. And again, that's not to say that I agree with everything that Melody or anyone has to say. It's just the way you're spinning this, the way Thunderfoot is spinning this, is ridiculous. In that same vein, harassment policies at conferences should not be limiting to you. I've been to many conferences since this conversation started. I was at the conference, Women in Secularism 1, where this conversation actually did get started. And I've seen these harassment policies. They're not that restrictive. The only people who, who would be potentially hurt or limited by these policies are people who want to be creeps. Do you want to be a creep at conferences, Thunderfoot? I didn't think so. If not, the harassment policies don't affect you. If it is spelled out in black and white what is and is not acceptable at that conference, we define what that harassment is, then we can say whether or not there's any legitimacy to these claims. Which means you would no longer have to complain about people talking about rape threats or other things that you don't see as being threatening. I don't think that rape threats are acceptable. But we wouldn't be talking about whether or not they were acceptable if it was written black and white in the rules, rape threats are not acceptable. It would kind of allow us to move on to other things. On that note, conferences are privately funded affairs, meaning the organizers of that conference, like the moderators of YouTube channels and Twitter accounts, are entitled to make any rules that they want. If you don't want to follow those rules, don't go to the conference. Another thing, most of those people who were men who were speaking out against harassment at conferences were not bullied by the feminists into making the writing those articles. They chose to do it. I can't speak for everyone, but I know Michael, for example, volunteered to do it. He actually messaged her and says, hey, can I do this? And this was at the same time when he was not terribly happy with a lot of the people who were having this discussion, you know? Um, he and others don't necessarily agree with Rebecca Watson on everything, but they thought that this issue was important, and so they decided to speak out about this. This brings me to one final point that I have to make about Thunderfoot's video and other videos and statements he's made in the past about the feminists and the atheist movement. And that's that no matter how I try to look at it, and no matter how fairly I try to examine the situation, the only conclusion that I can come to is that this is less about some sort of righteous crusade and more about Thunderfoot. I don't actually think that Thunderfoot is looking out for the best of the movement. I don't think that he actually cares as much about the movement as a whole as he would like to think that he does. He might think that he does. But in the end, I think it's less about the good of the movement and more about the good of Thunderfoot and his opinions. Thunderfoot says that he's appalled that someone like Melody Hensley, an executive director with the Center for Inquiry, would do something so creationist, as he describes it. But I happen to know that if an executive director at Center for Inquiry like Melody Hensley happened to agree with him, he would be singing her praises until, of course, she ceased to be useful to him. And then he would probably throw her under the bus, too. And I know this because he's done it before. And if he really cared about truth, then he would accept criticism more than he actually does. But when someone criticizes him, or when someone dissents from him, he either ignores them or calls them a troll. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that if you want to criticize the people at Free Thought Blogs or Skeptic, go ahead. But if you're actually looking for rational discussion, Thunderfoot is not the person you want to side with. And the fact of the matter is, the enemy of your enemy isn't always your friend. In fact, sometimes the enemy of your enemy can be an even bigger dick. And when it comes to the movement, YouTube, Twitter, that kind of stuff, doesn't actually matter that much. I know activists real 
activists who do things, who try to get the word out, who try to make this country and this world a better, safer place for non-believers, and a place where actual science and reason can flourish. And you can do this kind of activism while being a feminist, while being an atheist, while being any other kind of ist you want. It's about what you go out and do, not what you label yourself with. It's not about what blogs you read. It's not about what YouTube channels you watch. It's not even about how many people you block on any given social networking site. It's about your behavior. Perhaps Thunderfoot has done some good things when it comes to science. That's fine. But just because he has a lot of subs and hits on YouTube doesn't mean anything. It doesn't. It probably makes him feel good. That's all well and fine. But when it comes to actual movement activism, we could do without him. Because I would rather have an atheist activist or a secularist activist whose name is never heard and who never gets any hits on his or her YouTube channel, but who does great things, than an online pseudo-celebrity who doesn't do anything concrete, but who creates the illusion of greatness through popularity. But hey, there is one really good thing that I can say about Thunderfoot's latest video, and that's the fact that he's not calling it the rationalist community anymore. Thank you very much for finally paying attention to what people actually say and actually sounding like you're part of the movement you're trying to criticize. No one actually says rationalist community. Because most of us are empiricists, not rationalists.